a very warm welcome to um, our panelists and our audience to uh, the Mott McDonald London Climate Action Week debate, Net Zero, a winning strategy or a false sense of security. A couple of um, housekeeping um, factors. So we've disabled audience microphones and video, but we'd really welcome putting comments and questions in the chat. Um, the session is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the London Climate Action Week um, YouTube video. And uh, for the agenda, um, so I'll introduce the topic and the speakers. Then we're going to do a quick poll to see where you all stand on the debate topic. And then we'll do another uh, one at the end to see uh, whether the speaker's arguments have managed to sway your opinion. Uh, for the format, speakers will give uh, will each give three minute opening statements uh, and then we'll follow that by um, a panel discussion prompted by audience Q&A. So do drop your questions in the chat and also like other people's questions so we can see what the popular topics are. Then after that, the two team leads will have a chance to give some final statements and then we'll do the second audience poll. And as we wrap up, we will give you the chance to give us some front of mind views on the next steps for net zero. Um, so to set the scene, um, the science is clear on the imperative to contain greenhouse gas emissions and keep, and keep global warming below 1.5 degrees C. And net zero refers to the state where we have balanced the emissions we release into the atmosphere with the emissions we're able to remove to create a situation of net no emissions. And this um, is a significant undertaking and it's having increasing focus in the run up to COP26 in November. So at Mott McDonald, very similar to other companies that we've heard of throughout London Climate Action Week, we're committed to playing our part in this challenge. And we have a three pillar, three pillar strategy that focuses on our own operations. So our scopes one, two and three, our advocacy, um, the, our ability to influence our, our clients. Um, and also as a consultancy, we have the ability to choose the projects that we want to work on in the future, those that are aligned to a 1.5 degree world. So from an operational perspective, um, last year we were the first company, company of our kind to, um, to achieve uh, carbon neutrality globally. We have an SBTI certified 1.5 degree aligned emissions trajectory and a commitment to achieve net zero by 2040 or sooner if we can. Um, at, in terms of advocacy, as early as 2013, we co-authored um, the UK Treasury's Infrastructure Carbon Review and something close to my heart. Um, in 2019, we uh, founded the UK Net Zero Infrastructure Industry Coalition, um, which was set up to bring industry players together to support government in the how of achieving net zero. Um, and then in this year, we've done things like join the race to zero, um, announced this week the Powering Past Coal Alliance. We actively support um, Race to Resilience and are leading a work stream for the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. So the reason for stating all these um, is because as our experts across all these different initiatives have been discussing the progress, the unintended consequences, the, the fairness angle, we have recognized how many different perspectives and deep wells of knowledge there are and how important it is to understand the different positions and motivations. And that's what prompted the idea for this debate style event, to share the knowledge in an engaging way. Um, we have slightly polarized our speakers in the spirit of an interesting dialogue. So do please give them the benefit of the doubt if you disagree too, too vehemently with their arguments. So now, uh, to introduce our panel and a massive thanks for entering into the spirit of the debate so enthusiastically. In order of appearance, we have Mike Thompson, Chief Economist and Director of Analysis at the um, Climate Change Committee and our team lead today for Net Zero as a winning strategy. Uh, Mike was responsible for the UK Climate Change Committee's 2019 advice on, the net, on Net Zero that led to the UK being the first G20 company country to adopt a net zero target. And um, shortly afterwards, Mike also helped establish the New Zealand Climate Change Commission. And whilst working on net zero, 
Mike has convinced his father to put in a heat pump, his mother-in-law to start driving an electric car, and his daughter to become a vegetarian. So he's um, living what he preaches. Um, second up, we have Sarah, Sarah Collenbrander, Director of the Climate Change and Sustainability Programme at the Overseas Development Initiative, um, and, team, and our team lead for Net Zero as instilling a false sense of security. So as an environmental economist, Sarah has supported policymakers across Asia, Africa and Latin America to develop low carbon development strategy. She was head of global programs for the Coalition for Urban Transitions. And Sarah only discovered that she was opposed to net zero emissions targets when she saw the flyer for this event. But she's very excited to play devil's advocate. We then have Polly Billington, um, CEO of UK100 and a net zero supporter. Polly established UK100 in 2016 and is the face of the organization. She's a campaigning and communication specialist with many influential roles under her belt. Um, and Polly got a haircut for the um, 1010 climate change campaign, which meant that she no longer needed to use a hairdryer, which meant that um, we'll all now scrutinize Polly's haircut whenever we see her speaking. Um, and uh, John Carsonson, our Mott McDonald's International Development Climate Change Lead and a Net Zero Challenger. John has vast experience of in the fields of sustainable development, environment and climate change, has represented perspectives of private sector, governments, United Nations and NGOs. Um, recently, as a previous role, including head of profession for climate and environment at um, the Department for International Development, the UK aid agency. And a fun fact about John is that whilst um, at a Montreal protocol meeting in Copenhagen in the 1990s, John held an ashtray for the Queen of Denmark, who is, uh, was and is an avid smoker. So I hope that um, creates a sense of excitement that we've got such a great um, vast array of experience and committed um, people for this event. So first, the audience poll. If you open the chat function, you should shortly see a poll that will ask you to vote on whether you see net zero as a winning strategy or whether you feel it's um, giving us a false, false sense of security. So hoping, um, definitely need to open up the chat. Something's coming up for me. I can see in the meeting chat, I'm not sure if everyone else can see how um, the voting's going, which is somewhat neck and neck at the moment. Um, we weren't sure whether external people can see what's, what's, uh, what's going on. Um, but uh, I can see that um, mm, it was absolutely neck and neck, but right now, uh, yeah, winning strategy is down at 47%. Uh, 46 percent and the the opposing view is 54 percent so we'll let that play out for a while um have a feeling that it may be slightly to do with the fact that um we had last week for mott mcdonald's sustainability week we had a practice run and we did actually sway the audience um so uh, depending on how many mott mcdonald people are joining they may maybe the people that are swaying the vote. So right now we'll move on, but it's um, winning strategy, 45%, full sense of security, 55%. Um, but um, I'm absolutely convinced that um, we will be able to uh, bring some really good views in both directions and potentially that will get swayed. So um, now uh, moving on to our speakers and um, introducing Mike, um, to give your opening remarks. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Claire. A lovely introduction. And we, we nearly ended up <clears throat> 48 52, didn't we? But we just just avoided that, which is a bit of a relief. Um, I, as you said, Claire, we, we recommended the net zero target at the Climate Change Committee. So, so no surprises that I think it is uh, the right thing to do. I thought I'd just kind of give a brief bit of background as to why we recommended it. And then just explain kind of the, the experience we've had since it's been adopted in the UK and, and how we've th seen things uh, change since it, it came in. 
Um, the, the first thing to say is it, it's a scientific necessity. If you want to stop the world from warming, you've got to stop net emissions. You've got to stop adding to that blanket of greenhouse gases around the around the earth. Um, most of the greenhouse gases we emit, not all of them, most of them are long lived. So when you release them into the atmosphere, they stay there unless you take some others out and they stay there and they keep adding to that blanket. So that means that to stabilize temperature at any level, uh, you've got to you've got to stop adding, you've got to get to net zero. Um, interestingly, actually, if you were to get just those long lived gases to zero, net zero, and you were to keep having some of the short lived gases like methane in particular, and we don't think methane is something that you can get to zero. Actually, you know, that's fundamental in the, the biological processes of, of ruminant animals. Uh, at the moment, we don't know how to get it to zero. If you've got the long lived gases to net zero, you've got methane much reduced, but still non zero. We think actually you'd have about a 97 percent reduction in all in overall greenhouse gases in the UK. Now, we didn't recommend a 97 percent reduction for the UK. We recommended a 100 percent reduction and net zero for all greenhouse gases. And the reason that we did is that one, the Paris Agreement demands it. It says we have to have a balance overall. Uh, two, lots of countries around the world were thinking about their own targets at the point when the UK set ours. And we thought, look, setting it as a all greenhouse gases, all sectors target, that's a really powerful international signal. I think we've seen that played out, actually, and that, that has become uh, the gold standard overall. We also thought there was something that you could do, and that's kind of where it became really crucial. We just thought this is so much clearer. If you have a 100 percent target, a net zero target, that is enormously clearer than a 97% reduction or whatever you might have. If you kind of, if you just say we're going to reduce everything, not worry about the removals, we'll keep that separate. 100% just gave you this clarity that everything's got to go, everything's got to get to zero. Um, and that I think has been the thing that we've really seen play out since the target has been adopted in the UK. Um, we've gone from this kind of world before when we had an 80% target of of not me, Gov, or you know, maybe I'll do a few of the easy things, but I'm not going to do anything too difficult. Someone else can do that. I'm in the 20%. You know, and that that 20% doesn't exist anymore. So now you've got to do it. Whoever you are, whatever your sector, your emissions have got to go down to net zero. Um, and that I think has been huge in terms of just building interest, building consensus, uh, and building kind of business enthusiasm and local enthusiasm as well, which I'm sure Polly will talk about. Um, the other big one I think is there's a lot more public interest because we're no longer talking about a kind of technocratic target on the way to tackling global warming. We're now in a world where we're talking about stopping global warming. We're talking about getting to the point where we have dealt with the problem, not just that we're kind of on a path to dealing with it. Maybe we will get there eventually. And so I think it just is a much more, it's much simpler and it's a much more engaging concept. And that means that we have a lot more public interest in it and public interest breeds pressure it's the only real lever there is in a democracy and it means that you get more scrutiny more scrutiny means you get more action uh, and net zero is kind of the thing that's just turbocharged all of that and certainly that's been our experience of the last two or three years so many more people are so much more interested in net zero than they ever were in the 80 percent target before that so i'll conclude kind of on that point net zero is not climate action it doesn't do anything on its own but it makes it a lot easier for people to get working on acting, it makes it a lot easier uh, to be clear that everyone is in and it doesn't leave anywhere to hide. So it is part of a winning strategy. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, that is really compelling. Um, but now I will hand over to Sarah, um, who uh, I know is going to be equally as compelling. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Mike, for your opening remarks. I guess the first thing to say is, I too love a good net zero target. Who doesn't? Uh, objecting to net zero targets is like objecting to rainbows or puppies. Everyone likes rainbows and puppies. But you know who else says they like puppies? Cruella de Vil. I think we need to interrogate this a little bit more. So let's name a few of the other actors who have said that they like net zero targets. The Cruellas of the climate world, if you will. We have Shell, the oil major. We have Glencore, the world's biggest exporter of thermal coal. 
We have the United Arab Emirates, which accounts for 13% of the Middle East's oil production. None of them are pledging to end fossil fuel production. They're just pledging to reach net zero. So that list of names should send us a pretty clear signal that a net zero target doesn't necessarily mean very much. As Mike said, it's an engaging mechanism, but we need a fix right now. So what are John and I proposing instead? We think we need to reorient the debate now. The conversation about greenhouse gas emissions is about actual zero, not net zero, actual zero. Of course, as Mike laid out, the science tells us that we need to reach net zero as soon as possible, but that's at a global level. Anthropogenic CO2 emissions worldwide need to be balanced by anthropogenic CO2 removals, but it's really difficult to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at scale. And John will elaborate on that. Because of the difficulty of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or other greenhouse gas emissions, we need the overwhelming majority of human activity to be actual zero. And that's not Shell wearing a fig leaf. It's not Glencore covering their eyes. It's not the UAE buying offsets. It's not carbon neutral. It's carbon free. So let's go back to the question of why the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the Paris Agreement use terms like net zero. First, there are a few economic and social economic activities that are really important where it's really technically difficult or prohibitively expensive to reduce their emissions. Steel, aluminium, plastics, aviation. It's not impossible, but it's hard. So we do need to find ways to cut emissions from these hard to abate sectors through circular economy, substitution, behavioural change and so on. But if we can't fully eradicate these emissions, net zero accounts for that shortfall. It's not the same in the energy sector. We know that we can produce clean energy. It's just that Shell and Glencore are choosing not to and hiding that behind a net zero target. And the second reason we need to think about net zero at a global scale and not a country scale or a firm scale is to take account of different levels of development. Without radical innovation, building essential infrastructure demands the production of some emissions. Low income countries from Mali to Myanmar are going to need some atmospheric space to get the building blocks of development in place. Afforestation, bioenergy and other carbon dioxide removal techniques can buy them that space. But none of those techniques are advanced enough and nor are they likely to be to offset the polluting activities of our net zero friends like Shell and Glencore. And that's why the rest of us need to move beyond net zero targets and talk about actual, actual zero targets. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you both of you so far for keeping to time um, to make the most of the, the questions. Um, so where this is going is, Sarah, you're challenging the net in net zero. Um, so Polly, back to you to support Mike. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, the really good thing about net zero is that it is enabling politicians to begin to grasp what is required. Now, I can't defend the fact that this realisation is very late. I've been campaigning on climate change on and off since the late 1980s. But that's not a fault of the assessment that uh, that is actually helped decision makers understand what is required and start to move uh, to uh, where we need to be. Um, and having a net zero target is not an argument or a justification for delay. It has now helped to create the political environment in which people are starting to accelerate action and do it now. Um, contrary to the arguments of those who are sceptical of the target, it is actually driving politicians to do more. Now, if we have a situation where offsets are continually a get out of jail free card, then of course that undermines the case for what net zero is trying to be. But let us remember that what net zero does is it creates the opportunity for people to be able to see the benefits of going to being carbon free as much as possible, as close as possible to their homes. We have these arguments quite a lot. Um, our network of local leaders um, are very anxious about the idea of uh, ending up sort of paying for offsets for something to happen somewhere else when they could actually be delivering proper uh, net zero or zero carbon solutions in their own communities which benefit their communities there and then. So in some ways um, what net zero does is focus the politician's mind. Do I actually want to be 
um, doing this so-called the easy way and then finding myself having to pay money to someone else somewhere else to get me out of this uh, problem. They don't want to do that. They want to be investing in their own communities. Now, the net zero target in and of itself is not enough because political will matters. Um, it, um, if it focuses only on those technological solutions, of course it will fail. And much as I'm on the same side as Mike in this conversation, what I think is really important to understand about what the Committee on Climate Change uh, is doing in terms of recommendations is it does almost inevitably focus on a lot of those technological solutions. So you will have conversations about carbon capture and storage, you'll have conversations about hydrogen, particularly when it comes to transport, um, uh, and uh, because of the stresses on the uh, on the electricity grid, uh, grid, if we go all to EVs. And I keep saying, why aren't we talking about the buses? Because frankly, what we need to see is that technological uh, technologies only come out of political decision making. And we need to be able to make sure that political decision making focuses on the co-benefits of the of uh, decent climate action. The reality is you cannot meet the laws of science and physics, which is what um, climate change is, is uh, posing us as a challenge by ignoring the laws of politics. Um, technology and its ability to solve problems is determined by political conditions and will. So don't forget the liberating nature of, that, has, that so many advanced societies have experienced by harnessing electricity and industrialised heat. And that, as Sarah has pointed out, is exactly what developing uh, communities, societies and economies are also seeking. Trying to leapfrog over the dependency on fossil fuels is actually what a really important part of the net zero global story should be. But when climate change is framed as an imminent disaster, and this is my real concern about saying that net zero is not a winning strategy, is what is the alternative? I'm not interested in sucking um, uh, carbon dioxide out of the air after we've um, emitted it when we can actually do things further upstream. I'm neither am I interested in frightening the living bejesus out of everybody who has got a vote in democratic societies that this is going to be an imminent threat to everything that they hold dear without giving them some alternatives that they can actually see. So that is why we need to start framing this and presenting it as a way not only of uh, not only of, of tackling climate change, but also existing challenges, growing prosperity. You have much more chance to build public consent and support. Just a few highlighted examples of that growing the health, wealth and well-being of our communities from um, a, a piece of research that we're doing on making the economic case for acting on climate now, particularly in local communities. Um, investment in climate action at local level could see over 800,000 green jobs across the UK by 2030. That's in nine years time, rising to 1.38 million total jobs by 2050. One pound invested in climate mitigation um, uh, means that you actually save the, um, the uh, um, protecting communities from the impacts of uh, extreme weather events, saves nine pounds, according to the National Audit Office. It actually saves the NHS money, too. We have the opportunity to be able to uh, transfer, transform our communities in a way that builds public consent and support all, um, along the way. Without that, we will not be able to tackle climate change. So just a reminder that much of this is, again, like I say, about political will and the polit and harnessing the laws of politics. So if the laws of physics can't be changed, the laws of the land can be. That's why we argue that actually what you need is more power at local level to be able to achieve net zero as close as possible to where the emissions are made. If you are going to offset and frankly, act upstream and as early as possible to accelerate economic and social transformation as well as tackling climate. Take a breath. Awesome. <laughs> um, so um, where this is going is Polly has taken the, you know, the, the, the top down approach and she's brought the community's um, angle into it and the, the co-benefit co-benefits but she's asking for the what is the alternative if net zero doesn't do it and our last speaker John um, I think has some ideas about that so over to you John. Thank you I hope so. Um, we absolutely need urgent action on climate change. We have needed urgent action on climate change for decades. It hasn't happened. Uh, my challenge is about the negative part of the net. 
Pursuit of negative emissions, negative carbon emissions, is a result of the conflict between a political climate target that many did not want to accept could not be met, and the scientific reality that meeting that target required fundamental systematic shifts in our societies. And unfortunately, we are hitting that target now, or will be with 40% uh, chance within the next one to five years. That is close enough for me to say we're hitting the target. The required negative emissions are not a consequence of science. It is a result of political choices. Now, one of the options, uh, BEX, uh, which is by energy with carbon capture and storage, requires use of a land area the size of Australia to um, uh, and exclusively for uh, for that purpose. The problem, we don't have that much spare land. Using land for this purpose would have a significant impact on food security due to diverted land use and has rightfully been characterized as merely shifting an atmospheric risk to a terrestrial risk, rather than addressing the actual risk. Um, I won't even start on the potential biodiversity impacts of doing this. Uh, in short, this simply adds to, uh, to the risks uh, in, uh, to an already challenging situation for uh, developing uh, countries. Now, net zero will be gained. Colleagues of mine, who have been involved in carbon trading for many, many years. Uh, they all know this, they say this. If in doubt, look at the net zero oil companies, achievable, achievable if you disregard the use of their products, or net zero airports, achievable only if you disregard the flights and the cars getting in and out of the airport. This isn't the only problem for developing countries, and that's uh, one of the areas that I'm focusing on, that the net zero concept isn't globally applicable. The only reason why we have this conversation is that um, when we stop our greenhouse gas emissions, we will have created a new CO2 uh, equilibrium with higher levels and higher temperatures that will last for hundreds of years. Um, now, if we were just talking about maintaining the uh, equilibrium level, uh, then there is room, as um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, of um, uh, low level greenhouse gas emissions. And fortunately so, because farming is a significant source. Um, but the per capita amount of the acceptable level of CO2 emissions uh, is probably in the range of 25% of, of our current footprint in the UK. But most developing countries are not even near these levels today. Um, India is probably around that level. So it's not surprising that developing countries point to a situation where they say, we didn't create this historic problem and we can stay within that equilibrium level with the modest financial support that is being provided today to create a, a climate smart, low carbon uh, pathway for their development. Um, and that's why NDCs are talking about energy efficiency and intensity uh, and not net zero. Uh, so to ensure social and climate justice, the negative emissions of net zero should only be pursued by those who exceed that equilibrium. And it should be kept to an absolute minimum, as we have heard. And, and that's the bit that it has to be really, really significantly regulated and tied down. Um, so it means that it's making uh, like our share of negative emissions larger. So what we have to commit to must be even larger and even more funding must be provided to developing countries if we can't get our policy action to, uh, to decarbonize rapidly and swiftly. Um, but we are already struggling to find the volumes required uh, just to enable developing countries not to exceed uh, that equilibrium with low carbon development uh, ambitions. The last point is that 
even you if you accepted the need for negative emissions in the future instead of rapid decarbonization now, that would come with increased vulnerability in the meantime due to climate impacts of so-called overshooting. So we would be reaching well above two degrees for a long period of time until the effects of uh, extracting emissions uh, would set in. Net zero requires a lot of uh, adaptation and resilience work, which is exactly where the developing countries are more vulnerable than developed economies. And that is why the, the concept without being tied down, in my view, doesn't work. It has generated debate, it has generated some commitment, but unfortunately, it is also being gamed. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and my takeaway from that is, um, so not just as Sarah said, challenging the net, but you're, um, you're advocating strongly reg regulating that net, net to make sure that um, we can maintain an equilibrium. So uh, I'm going to move on to questions now. Um, I've got a few that I'm interested in, but um, and I'm noticing in the chat there's some great chat, but it's um, I haven't seen that many questions. Um, uh, so, but I'm going to ask some, and then I'm going to have a look and see um, what we've got. So, my first question I think is um, to the lead. So, um, Mike and Sarah which is how crucial public awareness is to the vision of the future. So um, Polly touched on this, which is um, advocating not the um, scaremongering, but the, the, the encouragement for different lifestyle changes, um, et cetera. And I suppose depending on your stance, this could either be as a driver of this absolutely crucial demand reduction or, or as a driver of rapid um, adoption of all these alternative te technologies, or indeed through um, lobbying for political and business change. Um, so um, where, yes, yeah, so back to this, this angle of the public awareness, what are your thoughts on that? So starting with Mike and then Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Well, look, it's absolutely crucial. It's crucial for all of the reasons that you just said. Um, so look, we've estimated that slightly over 50% of the reductions that we need to do, reductions in our, our emissions, will need people to do things differently. So that might be really kind of active things like changing their diet, like changing their travel choices, moving to the bus, um, and then a big chunk as well, which is adopting new technologies. So things like driving an electric car instead of a conventional car, um, putting in a, a heat pump instead of a gas boiler, things that are kind of, they have to be engaged in, they, they're not going to kind of just happen without people actively making those decisions. Um, and also it needs that people are politically active and, and that they care that the government is doing what it what it said it's going to do, um, which is to, to enact an awful lot of policy and drive through an awful lot of change, because this is going to move, this is going to mean disruption in people's lives. Um, we passed the point where, you know, we, we switch out a few coal power stations for some windmills, and people switch the light and it still comes on just the same. We're at a point where this is people's lives being different because of the changes that are made. So, so public engagement is key. And I think that we've definitely seen with net zero, it is just, it, it captures the public imagination more. So that in, in a way that the targets before never have done, in a way that look, what the UK has done with setting a 2035 target of 78%, that is, that is far more radical than a, a net zero target of 2050. But the public didn't. Re it's too technical. Most people kind of can't engage with that sort of that sort of thing. They just kind of hear noise of targets in a way that they did engage with net zero. And and it has stimulated this debate and it's made a platform that you can have a, a phone in now on five live saying, what is a heat pump? Right. What what, what do I do instead of a gas bottle? We couldn't have that before net zero. Now we can. That is a huge, huge change. And it, it, it's necessary or, or we won't we won't make the change that we need. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Mike and Sarah, is that good enough? Well, I think what we're actually seeing here, Claire, is that Team Net Zero are taking everything good that's happened on climate change in the last few years and attributed it to net zero targets. And I, I think that I would challenge that proposition. So, for example, a few of the other milestones in the last couple of years that I think 
also deserve recognition for their huge public engagement, which I think John and I would wholeheartedly agree is important for climate action. The, the debate is not should people be embracing climate action, the debate is the feasibility of the net zero target. And I think that things like the IPCC report in 2018, where net zero was put forward, but also the importance of even a fraction of a degree difference in global warming and the profound impacts that would have on people's lives. That really resonated with people, seeing the millions of additional people who would face water scarcity, extreme heat, uh, the extent of sea level rise and so on. Those factors also injected that sense of urgency alongside the net zero. Of course, 2019, the year after the IPCC report, was distinguished by those tremendous student strikes, Fridays for the Future all over the world, and the Climate Summit, uh, chaired by the UN Secretary General, where you had a galvanization of, of commitments and activity. And, and of course, I think net zero can take some credit for that. But I don't think it's the whole of it. We've had 20 to 30 years of strong climate evidence generation, mobilization and communication. I think, Mike, I think the CCC gets a lot of credit for, for building energy before that, even before net zero gets on the scene. And I think that's really exemplified when we look at what the difference, the net zero target made, it reveals some of the problems we're actually facing. Because what we had before the net zero target came on the scene is we had a bunch of countries around the world that were using evidence-based approaches to climate policy, like the UK, which had an 80% commitment in its reductions. And what we've seen with the net zero debate is that countries that have evidence-based approaches have certainly then taken that extra step, including the UK, to make a more ambitious commitment. But you basically had a bunch of others pile in without commensurate climate policy. You might have seen, you know, Canada with its tar sands oil plans jumping on the net zero bandwagon. Australia hypothesizing a net zero target, even as it digs up all the coal in the country. So I, I think what we need to do is separate net zero from public engagement and say we all want public engagement. But what we need is an informed, empowered public. And part of that is saying that they need to get as close to actual zero as possible. Can I yep. come back in, Claire? Very quickly, yep, and then we'll move on. Yes. Just, just to say, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree with all that, but it's all an awful lot easier with net zero. I remember the conversations on heating, particularly in an 80% world, and all you could get to was, do we really need to do it? Can't we just be a bit more efficient? This is the bit mm. that will be in the 20%. And now, since the net zero target, it's really clear, we all know gas boilers are polluting, they've got to go. And it, that clarity, you didn't have it before and you couldn't get past stage one of do we need to do it? Whereas now it is all just about how do we do it? You can't engage the public when the technocrats and the policymakers are arguing, do we need to do it? You can only engage them once you say we have to do it. How do you want to do it? That's where we are now. That's why net zero matters. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, I'm taking a question from the chat from Ben Summers. Uh, which is, um, it's got three likes, so um, that's good going. I agree that net zero is a useful tool, but how do we avoid the problem of those who might hide behind the label instead of taking the necessary action that could promote truly beneficial beneficial change towards real tangible carbon reduction? So um, that's, uh, that's a um, picking up on the challenge that Sarah and John have been stating. So it's a question for Mike and Polly. So maybe start with Polly. You've got to verify what people are doing. It has just got yeah. to be external verification of it. And um, declarations are all very, very well and good. What's interesting is that um, once people have declared, they suddenly realise what they've got to do. And um, they either step back and go, oh, dear, OK, right, well, that is a declaration that's going to be filed in the bottom drawer. Or they start running around trying to get something done. And the, what, what is particularly challenging, particularly for those people who have not spent every day eating and breathing climate change, um, like many of the people on this call, is that it's a very, very steep learning curve to understanding what can be done, what should be done, what needs to be done now, what needs to be done next, what you can leave longer, what you can do later, what the technologies are that are viable and so forth. And not only that, but measurement, disclosure, monitoring is comparing apples and oranges almost all of the time. Just an example, there are two different mayoral covenants that at Paris agreed that they would be aligned so the mayor, mayors across the world could use the same kind of agreement on, on how they were, were getting to, uh, to demonstrable climate emissions reductions. That still hasn't happened. 
we can't get our members to say, oh, don't worry, sign up to this and it'll be it'll be OK. And even the ones that are there, we are, we still struggle because the global measures, which are very desirable for um, alongside the UNFCCC and IPCC and all the global measurements are very desirable in that way, don't necessarily work very well in a particular national context. And when people are more likely, apart from the global cities, when people are more likely to compare the, their ambitions and their delivery against the people down the road, so it'll be Swindon versus Sunderland as distinct from Swindon versus Seoul, right? You want to make sure that those measurements are, 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 are good enough. And that's where, yes, it's technical and yes, it's complex, but unless you have that valid, that proper validation, particularly for um, people who have who are new to it, and that's what most politicians are, you will not get decision makers to feel comfortable with what they're doing. They also don't like the fact that actually once they start doing that, it shows how far they've got to go. And I think what's really interesting, and this goes back to Mike's point, since we've started to talk about net zero, you've actually got politicians um, and allowing their administrations to publish graphs showing how bloody difficult it's going to be. Now, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, I am going to ask a question um, that uh, pulls it back a bit. It's from Tom Doland of the um, of UK Crick, um, which is um, and, and you can link it to personal experience. Um, that would be good. But the question is, if I personally had £10,000 to invest, how could I use that to make the biggest difference possible? Um, alternatively, if I were able to donate four hours of my time per week, how could I make the biggest difference? So on the assumption that you all live the dream in some way, um, answer that, but also um, in addition to the, the haircut, hair dryer um, and influencing your family, what more can people do? And maybe that's um, pension investments, that sort of thing. So we'll start with John um, and then Mike. Um, and then uh, Sarah and then Polly. I, I would personally start off with the things that would cost you very little by starting to cycle uh, instead of driving. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I have uh, reduced my uh, driving. I don't yet have an electric vehicle, but uh, my driving is um, uh, less than a thousand miles per year. Um, I cycle uh, a lot. I've changed my diet to a largely plant-based uh, diet, not exclusively. Those are things that you can do actually without the investment. Um, when when it comes to things that it would be worthwhile doing, I, I've personally found that making sure that uh, that my energy uh, supply um, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, low carbon so i have put uh, solar panels uh, on my roof which has been a great investment uh, the challenge uh, around that investment is that you could have managed to get a higher return on your investment uh, if you had done uh, other things but it has been a good investment and i think that's the problem we need to overcome that um, we are we are comparing different types of investments, and we need to make it more attractive uh, to uh, to invest, for example, in solar panels and other things. Because thank you. It, John, it is a, oh, it is a good thing. Yeah, I'll stop you there, Mike. Yeah, thank you. I I think I I would approach it the same way that that we approach the national targets. So I think measure, plan, act. So you know, get a sense of where your emissions are. If you're like John. You don't drive. Well, look, your car isn't the place to start. Your house might be, but if you're, you know, if you're a renter rather than a landlord, rather than a, a, an owner occupier, that might be difficult as well. Um, so, you know, for most of us, transport and the house are the two biggies that we can affect. But you know, for others, you know, maybe you take a lot of holidays, um, and then aviation is going to be a big one for you if you go overseas a lot. So, maybe you want to spend your ten grand on a caravan that you can do nice holidays at home. It will depend on who you are. Definitely do the easy thing. Spend £20 on a good vegetarian cookbook. You know, spend £20 on draft proofing your your doors and your windows if they're not already. You know, do the, There's loads of really simple things that don't cost a lot of money. The big hitters that you can spend that kind of thousands on is probably either your vehicle or your home. I would really recommend if you're looking at your home that you go through a kind of retrofit coordinator service. Those are 
popping up in, in lots of parts of the country now and they'll give you a kind of a plan where you can look at efficiency first and then over time move towards a heat pump at the right point for you um, those are really helpful I think they're, they're going to be a big part of the solution on uh, on our housing market um, but yeah I think it has to, you're going to have to make your own choice and you have to look at your own lifestyle and, and where your own emissions are coming from and uh, and, and approach it that way and it, it it's there, there are lots of different things for different people. Thank you. And, and I suppose what you're saying through the net zero thing is that now it um, it makes business sense for um, some of those metrics to be visible so that people can use them to make to take control of their own um, their own lifestyles. Uh, Sarah. I really like Mike's suggestion about a good vegetarian recipe book, and I would recommend the green roasting tin. So that's a small deduction of your 10K. Um, it sounds like you're really keen to mobilize, to have a multiplier effect on your emissions. And so I think a really useful way you could combine your time and your money would be to talk to others who live near you, picking up on Polly's points, uh, and see whether your 10,000 could be the starting point for people to collectively invest in community energy, district heating, shared car use, something like that, that would encourage your neighbors to also put in a few thousand pounds to something that makes everyone's life cheaper, greener, hopefully a bit more pleasant and community minded. I think that could be a really nice strategy if you have four hours a week and 10,000 pounds. Lucky you. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Polly. Right, if I must answer this question, <laughs> I will say, eat less meat and fly less. After that, frankly, if you're rich, which most people on this call globally are, spend your spare cash not just doing this to demonstrate to your neighbours that you are better than them, which is this virtue signalling nonsense which drives me mental and has done it since the late 80s. Um, and secondly, if you've got any spare time, spend it on changing the rules because it's the rules that make this expensive and it's the rules that mean that people like, like where I live, it's easy for me to cycle because I've got a local council that invests in cycle storage, that invests in separated and segregated cycle lanes, that invests in quiet ways, that has made sure that there is all of that infrastructure that lights the paths through the park. I also live somewhere where there's an integrated public transport system so I can walk safely home because somebody has bothered to put the lights on and that it is affordable. I know people on a minimum wage outside of London regularly have to spend at least an hour's worth of their wages simply getting to and from work on public transport and then people tell them not to get rid of that tell them to get rid of their car now that is why i'm not really interested in individual behavior change unless it is seen through the way that we design in ways to make people uh, do things that are easier for them better for them improve their their prosperity improve their health and their well-being I think that this has been one of the greatest weaknesses of the green movement ever since the, the raising of the climate change issue back in the late 80s, is that if we turn down our thermostat and put on our jumper, we're going to be able to save the Arctic. We are not going to save the Arctic. It is big rules, big laws and big changes that are required. And we, if you've got any time at all, do get people to change the bloody rules. Don't spend your time demonstrating to your neighbour that you think you're a little bit better than them. Good, you've got lots of um, claps and celebration for that, Polly. Thank you. Um, so with an eye on the time, um, just to let um, Mike and Sarah know, we'll come to the closing arguments. And there's a question, Sarah, that um, if you can have a think about, because it's got lots of likes, um, uh, and uh, John can chip in, which is, uh, so if you can pull it into your closing argument, um, a question for the anti net zero side. What is the alternative? Net zero is net zero is scientifically accurate and we simply have to remove some or some greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Yes, we have to be vigilant about gaming, but this would be the case with any emissions reduction framing. So genuine question. What other strategy is there? Um, so let us, um, I'm just wondering if we can squeeze in one more question, um, which, uh, so there is one I really liked, um, which I'm just now drastically looking for, that I think, um, uh, Mike, if you've got any sort of one or two sentence um, 
responses to this. Um, how do we get the Treasury to embed net zero completely in our national spending? The support to Nissan's new battery facility is very welcome today. Any quick snippets on that? I know it's a hard one. Yeah, I mean, I, two things. One, I think we should be celebrating things like Nissan's announcement today as big climate triumphs, right? I kind of, I'm in climate Twitter and it barely registers on there and I kind of pick it up by the BBC as a business story, right? This is a climate story. This is because it is working and we should be celebrating this is a good thing because we have good climate policy and we, we miss out on that to our, to our disadvantage, I think. And the Treasury, look, we have said to the Treasury, you have to be a much bigger part of this than you've been before. And I think we just all need to keep shouting it loudly. I think we will get a, a review from the Treasury. Treasury have asked for climate commitments within all the spending review bids in a way they haven't before. They are coming round on this. There is a space, but I think the pressure has to be relentless on the Treasury. They are fundamental to success. And I just noticed today, again, Tom Dolan no, um, noticed and shared it, that there's a consultation out on the governance of net zero um, so that's something uh, maybe we we all take away and think about how we can respond to. Right. So um, a very quick um, closing argument so that we then are ready to do our second poll and see um, where we got to. So um, I'm just thinking. So Mike and then Sarah. OK, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to try and pick up some of the, the objections that were made to net zero. Um, I want to start with kind of with Bex and negative emissions and the, the kind of objection to that. John, I agree, it is, it's really difficult. It's a really hard thing to be doing. And I think most industries out there that are responsible for emissions understand that. They get that if the world of offsetting in the future is removals, which is what net zero tells you it is, not just kind of kind of phantom offsets, which it too often is today, they know those are going to be expensive. They know they're going to be scarce. They know there's going to be competition for them. And it says to them, look at your own emissions. Do what you can to cut your emissions. I don't think it's a coincidence that suddenly the aviation industry is looking at sustainable aviation fuels, that they're looking at hydrogen aircraft, that they're, they're getting serious about, you know, jet zero, because they realise that this is their chance for um, survival and to control this bit of expenditure that rather than just having to throw cash at someone else to do stuff, this is kind of, so they are now engaging with solutions in a way they never did before net zero because they have to. Now look, that doesn't mean those things are kind of silver bullets, doesn't mean they're easy either, but net zero has got us attention on those things precisely because actually the negative stuff is so hard to do. So I don't think there's any kind of credible solution out there where negative emissions stops us doing easy stuff. It will only ever be there for the hard stuff. And even for the hard stuff, it is focusing minds on what do I do to actually cut my emissions? Um, fundamentally, I think you come back to the kind of metrics for success. And the, the only thing that we care about is, are we acting to cut emissions? So I look at the targets that are now being set across the world. What path would they get us onto if they are delivered? Before Paris, before net zero, we were on track to three degrees at best, possibly uh, even higher than that. Now, if all the targets are delivered, we're on track to two degrees. There's an awful lot to do to get us there, but the conversation is now in the right place. It's, are the policies happening? Is the action happening? We can focus on those things as well as needing a few more targets to get us where we want to be uh, well below two degrees. And then the other I really wanted to come back to, can I come back on just the Cruella's one quickly? We've got time. Just, I, I think it kind of, you know, I guess one, what were they all doing before? Because they weren't doing a great deal then either. Two, net zero at least gives you something, a hook that you can hang things on. And three, let's kind of just remember what the theory of change here is. It isn't that suddenly the oil companies all go under a conversion. They see the light and they think, oh, we're going to stop digging oil. We're going to do something else. The, the theory of change here is you, have a strong target, you drive action like we've seen in the UK, phasing out phasing out petrol and diesel cars, switching over to offshore wind. You have policies that bring forward those things more quickly and they mean that we don't want oil anymore and the oil companies have to change to survive. That's the theory of change, not that they kind of do it out of the goodness of their hearts and that if we had a magic, the best target, suddenly they will do it. So it is, I mean, it comes back fundamentally to what Polly said, system change, net zero is making system change easier and it is the best strategy we've ever had. 
brilliant. You're very compelling. Um, so Sarah, over to you for the final word. And um, uh, uh, you know, uh, un admitting that we slightly forced you into this position, the lucky point is you've only got a minute to tell us. Don't worry, Claire. I've convinced myself uh, mm -hmm. with John. <laughs> so I think I think fundamentally. Uh, all of the speakers on this call are in agreement. We all think we need really robust, rigorous accounting mechanisms that avoid carbon leakage across borders that ensure that at a global level we reach net zero. The point on which, which we disagree is what a strong target looks like. And John and I just don't believe that that is net zero for everybody. We don't think a strong target is one that the likes of the cruel, as I mentioned before, which I hope is what we take away from this debate, uh, is one that they can hang their hat on. The point should be we should be having the kind of conversation that meaningfully recognises their future, is the, the limits of the, on their future under anything like their current business models. We need everything that people have spoken about on this call, individual behaviour, collective behaviour, public engagement, big regulation, big investment, big change. Net zero has definitely played a role in getting us to where we are. The next step is to be really critically constructive around where net zero applies and who needs to set an actual zero target and who might not have a future in a net zero world. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. So we're ready for our uh, poll. Yes. Well done, Sarah. Um, ready for our poll. So again, um, it should come up in the chat shortly. And because we're clo so close to time, um, that final point, which is before you go, um, could you drop um, maximum three words? And they can be sort of three separate words that are just joined up in a theme about where you're front of mind for what Net, Net Zero needs to do next. And I can see that it's um, challenging and more regulation on that the net bit. Um, uh, so some of those are coming in. Um, but could you do that? And you'll need to do that before you drop off the call, I think, if you're external, because I don't think the chat's still available to you. Um, so, right, I have to do my vote and then I'll see what the poll's doing. Um, well, wow. Um, I don't know if everyone can see, but um, we the winning strategy has swayed it with um, we're up to 72 percent. Um, on the pro net zero and the 28% on the full sense of security. And I suppose, um, to be fair, so that some of the orchestrators, so Mike, you are really compelling on this because it's your baby. So um, maybe we were slightly unfair to the, to the other side, but um, uh, I think um, it's a pretty impressive swing that we've seen happen before our eyes. And I want to say thank you to, to everybody who put questions in and comments and apologies to those who haven't been able to have their questions answered. And potentially we could grab some of the best ones and come back with answers later, depending on the willingness of our audience. I want to absolutely commend and say thank you to our four panelists because um, you were amazing and um, I, I've even personally, I've learned so much and clearly what you're saying is only the tip of what's in the iceberg in your heads, in your teams. So um, definitely, if anyone wants to drop in, say, Polly, you mentioned um, the report that UK 100 um, is doing. If there's anything there that you want to drop in the chat and then a final point to say is we will be um, synthesizing what we've heard and we'll put it in a blog. We'll uh, ask the speakers to um, uh, put their um, inputs in if they're if they're happy to, and then we'll share that back out alongside the recording. So thank you, everybody. Um, definitely, big round of applause for the speakers. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, thank you, Claire. Claire. High five, Polly. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, everyone. Lovely to see you. Well done, Michael. <laughs> well done, John. <laughs> Cheers. Good debate. Thank you.